Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. We're so happy to have everyone here with us today. Today is March 8th. We are the Rotary Club of Gainesville. At this time, guests and visiting Rotarians, if you're joining us virtually on Zoom, please identify yourself in the chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, please register your participation by sending an email to info at rotarygainesville.org. I see you waiting in the wing. Come on. Pete and Wall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Randy Caton. Okay. <laughs> I'll come give you a hug after. Randy Caton uh, needed a loan, so he went to Matt Brady for a loan. And, uh, and so Matt said, what's this for? Randy said, well, it's uh, sort of for my car. So Matt gave him the loan signature loan. Randy th said, thank you, Matt. Now I can go out and finally fill up my car for the first time in several weeks. Okay, if you don't like it, he's back there complaining. We're going to sing God Bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her. allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And God bless the Ukrainians. At this time, Kevin Thorpe is with us to lead us in prayer. Kevin. May we pray. Uh, Lord, we are grateful for this day and all that it means. Uh, we thank you especially for last week, such a great time of fun and fellowship. Uh, thank you for showering your blessings upon us. We look forward to today's presentation and hearing from Dr. Hayes uh, concerning safety on the University of Florida campus. Continue to bless what we do and what we say. It is for your sake and for your glory. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Thorpe. You may be seated unless you um, brought a guest or are a visiting Rotarian. And if so, we will send the mic around and have make some introductions. Jason is coming up for the mic. He'll be okay. there in just a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Start in the back. Yeah, when I come around. Yes. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ben Campen. I'm pleased to have as my guest today a fellow Rotarian, Ed Book. I wasn't going to say anything about him running for office because that'd get me in trouble. <laughs> My we have one more. Um, I'd like to introduce, I'm Jason Shank, and I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Moore. Uh, My guest today, I don't know if anybody recognized Jacqueline, but she's our number one. She runs our store on 39th Avenue, but really I wanted to mention Jacqueline came out, she purchased a ticket to the Wild Game Feast, came out on Thursday morning at 9.30, made us breakfast, which was awesome, um, was a big part of doing the tenderloin with Terry Sullivan, got all that ready for the Fellowship Pavilion, and then rolled uh, quickly there into tickets, and then found herself in the parking lot with Doug Wilcox for the next few hours, <laughs> uh, helping park cars and getting people in, and finally we had to drag, drag her back inside so she could come enjoy the event, but um, thank you very much, Jacqueline, for being such a great part. Thank you. 
we have anyone else? Okay, all right. Well, we welcome everyone today. Um, we actually have two Rotarians whose birthday fall on today. So at this time, we, could we recognize TJ and Ryan? Come on, stand up. Hey, let's let's sing happy birthday to them. Pete, will you help me? Birthday. Happy birthday to you. Hey, happy birthday to two great Rotarians. All right. So we have a couple of announcements. We're going to miss Jay if he doesn't come up every week. So I called him and I said, Jay, you got to come back up one more time. Come on, let's give a round of applause for our great feast master. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Well, there's only one word to describe it, and that's wow. What a feast. Let's give ourselves a hand. So obviously, it wouldn't have been possible without record sponsorship. The sponsorships were unbelievable. We totally blew anything we've done in the past out of the park. So just amazing. So thank you to all of our sponsors. First of all, let's give them a big round of applause. Now, this thing doesn't happen by itself. There's a lot of volunteers, you know, people coming up and telling me, Jay, that was a great feast. You know, honestly, without all the volunteers that we had participate, a lot of you out there been out there over the weeks and you're out there during the feast. I mean, just, just an amazing group of folks. And that includes the, the organizations that are receiving funds as a result of this. They were out in full force volunteering, not only pre-feast, but during the feast as well. So let's give them all a big round of applause. And, you know, it wouldn't be possible without our, our partnerships with the other, other Rotary Clubs here in town. And I'm just truly amazed by the outpouring of support that we got from the other clubs this year. We've got some members here uh, today that are from the other clubs. Just amazing ticket sales, sponsorships, attendance. So I want to give all the other clubs in town a big round of applause because they were absolutely amazing. It would not be possible without you. And I want you all to know that for me, I greatly appreciate everything that you did. And then each one of you individually out here who either bought a ticket, showed up, sponsored, you know, did anything that you could to help me. I appreciate it. You know, day of the feast, Doug Wilcox comes up and says, you need somebody to help with parking? I said, do I? And he said, yes, you do. And so he stepped up and took care of it. So it's people like that, and that's just one example. You know, if I was gonna list all the people that made this possible up here, you guys wouldn't be leaving at one o'clock. So we're not gonna do that, but I want each one of you to know that I really appreciate everything that you did. So we had about 1,500 plus people in attendance. That number is, is a pretty good number. It may have been a little bit more, but that's probably around where we are. Uh, as a result of this feast, all three organizations, the Gainesville Opportunity Center, the UF Mobile Outreach Clinic, and then the Child Advocacy Center. They're all gonna be funded for everything that they ask for. And that is a special day for us. So let's give ourselves a round of applause for making that happen. So finally, I think you all know this, and it really goes without saying, but I think it needs to be said. And that is, there's uh, one individual in this club, and there's a family in this club that makes this feast possible every single year, has been there since the beginning. And that is Wes Eubank. With the help of Marsha, Wes, this feast would not be possible without you. And we all know that, we all recognize that. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate all your effort and everything that you did to make this feast possible. We all appreciate you and what you do. It would not have been possible without you. So with that, give Wes a standing round of applause, please. And Marsha as well. Marsha, thank you. With that, we're looking for sponsorships for next year's feast. It'll be, it's around the corner. We're gonna have a great time. 
It's going to be another Chamber of Commerce day. Eric has told me for sure it will be. So with that, thank you again for allowing me the privilege to be the feast master of 2022. I think soon I will have the acronym PAST added to that. And that's a really good feeling. So thank you all. Thank you for all that you did. I really do appreciate it. Great job, Jay and, and everyone. Okay, we have a couple of a quick announcements before we get to our program. Um, Mike Conroy, you had something you wanted to share with us. Good afternoon, everybody. What a great feast that was. I want to thank everybody here. Several weeks ago, uh, I was very concerned about our participation in the Rotary U speech. And this is the first year we've had it after several years where we've, the schools have just been chaotic because of COVID and masks and disorganization. And so we weren't getting a tremendous response from the teachers who were really kind of overwhelmed to begin with. So I brought it to the club and Richard Allen, Nancy Hart, and others rose to the occasion, put the word out, and I gotta tell you, we've got all the students that we're gonna need for a successful competition, but more importantly, or uh, yeah, more importantly, we've now got students from Hawthorne and Newberry for the first time ever. So uh, that's what we wanted. You know, We wanted to have all the schools included, and we've done that. So that's congratulations to you. Thanks for your help. Thank you, Mike. We really appreciate all of your hard work. Okay, I think we are ready to turn the program over to our president, David Grayson. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's great to, to see everyone here. And um, I want to begin uh, just to ask you to keep Susan Crowley in your thoughts and prayers. Her mother passed away, uh, Miss Skipper. So just uh, please remember Susan and, and their family in your thoughts and prayers. Um, another thing on kind of a, a more serious note, uh, a lot of you have, have reached out to me over the last couple of weeks about the, well, the humanitarian crisis going on in Ukraine. And, you know, is, is there a, something our club has set up or has the district done something? Um, I think Ben wouldn't mind my calling him out. Ben said if he, he definitely wants to support, but he'd like for our club and our district to get credit if he's going to do it, Ben Campen. So anyway, several folks like Ben have reached out to me, and, um, and I, I've, I've sent an email about this uh, over the weekend, but um, District Governor Richard Cooper and I have been communicating, and, and I think he's had this communication probably with a lot of different presidents and, and people, but um, finally, we have gotten a fund set up through the York Foundation, which is our, our District 6970, the foundation in E.T. York's name that will have an account set up where these monies will go to Ukraine and to, to help the folks there that have been displaced or otherwise adversely affected. So if, if you are so inclined, please just, just reach out to me and, I, and I'll, I'll make it easy for you to, to do your donation in, in whatever way that you wanna provide support. Um, another, uh, mentionable item here, and this is this is definitely on the on the happier side. We've already called TJ out for his birthday being today. I'm glad that uh, Melanie did have the song. We want to do that when someone's birthday falls on Tuesday. So TJ and Ryan, happy birthday! TJ showed me a picture on his phone um, of his wife's belly, and it's a, a sonogram. And I, I wish we could throw it up on the screen. That'd be cool. Um, 11 weeks, Courtney, 11 weeks with child. So wonderful, TJ. I'll tell you, the, the Rotary International could definitely use another Pache uh, generations down the line, no doubt about it. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least um, <clears throat> say thank you uh, once again to Jay, I, I thanked him with a with a big hug and a and a draft beer in each of our hands at about uh, 9:45ish on Thursday night. But um, but you know I I I'll say I've I've seen a few feasts. I haven't seen nearly as many as Wesley and Dr. Caton and and Ben Campen and others. But I I've seen enough to know when we've got a really dedicated, solid feast master, solid leader, and that's what we've had here. 
Um, Jay, you, you just did a wonderful job. You, you, never, you never rested. And, and you and I have had some kind of candid conversations about the, the old cliche everyone's heard about the feast running itself. Well, you know, that's, that's just silly. But, well, really, really honestly, what, what happens is, you know, you're, you're, you're coasting along there and, and you're, you're running the foundation board meetings and everything's going fine. You've got, you're talking to Kirk Smith, who's handling the food you know, uh, making sure the beer is going to be there, et cetera. And then you're a week out from the feast and it suddenly gets really hectic. Like, wait a minute, I thought everything was cool, you know, but, but Jay was, he stayed cool the whole time. And uh, I never saw him raise his voice to anyone. And that's, that's commendable in itself. So um, uh, before we applaud Jay, I, I wanted, I don't want to wax um, poetically here, but um Friday morning, I was just, I, I had this notion that um, I, I didn't write anything down. So this, this isn't a, any kind of speech, but I, I just, I, I was thinking about it Friday morning and I, I really felt good about how we did, how our club and the other clubs, the foundation did and, and how Jay did and, and everyone that contributed. And I, I started sending out a, a few emails and texts just to some individuals that, um, Maybe we're in charge of the wine bar, like uh, like Linda, or in charge of the bar, like Helen, or in charge of the food, like Kirk. Um, Wesley, I uh, thank profusely every time I get, but th there were just certain people, uh, Doug Wilcox, who stepped up and did the parking since Ed Book had a wedding event for his son that was planned, and Ed had made sure everyone was ready, but boy, we, we needed someone that knew logistics and could tell people who were insistent that no you need to park over here and so thank goodness Doug was there but anyway back, back to my um this uh kind of uh, analogous thing with rotary I mean we're all um you know representing lots of different um different occupations uh different ethnicities etc uh, different religions all that stuff I, I'm, I'm not trying to go down anything like that but I, I just thought about this and you know we come together and and we're a we're a group we're the rotary club of gainesville and rotary international and together we're so much more than we are individually just stacked on each other and to me the wild game feast is just a beautiful representation of that i mean there's no way jay we just raised a big pile of money for three awesome organizations that are gonna change the lives of a lot of people around here. So thank you all and thank you, Jay. We've got a great program today. Uh, security was an important part of the Wild Game Feast. And uh, Eric Godet, I'm going to invite to come to the podium to introduce today's program, thank you. Thank you, President David. Okay, guys, we're in for a treat today. If you hadn't had the pleasure, you're about to experience Dr. Reed Hayes. He's the Director of Loss Prevention and Research Council. The topic today will be the University of Florida's Safer Places Lab. Dr. Reed Hayes started as a store detective in retail loss prevention and has over 30 years of hands-on crime and loss control experience, working with organizations worldwide a co-director of the Loss Prevention Research Team at the University of Florida and director of the Retailer Supplier Coalition, Loss Prevention Research Council. Dr. Hayes co-founded the University of Florida's globally used National Retail Security Survey in 1989 and has conducted over 75 LP field research projects. He has spoken at over 100 conferences, and is the author of over 20 peer-reviewed journal articles, over 150 magazine articles, four top-selling books, and provides crime prevention expertise to Fox News, CNN, NBC, CBS, ABC, NPR, Oprah, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Business Week, Forbes, Fast Company, USA Today, and the BBC. I'm telling you, I've had the pleasure to be in this guy's lab, and it is impressive what happened. So please welcome Dr. Reed Hayes. Oh, 
write even. Um, right, I have more journal articles than that now. If anybody's from UF, my boss makes sure we have a lot of journal articles. <laughs> um, thanks again, Eric, and poor Eric's had to put up with me a few times. Here. Okay, yeah, Eric's had to put up with me a few times lately. So uh, should I go ahead and start clicking? Okay. So um, the University of Florida Safer Places Lab, um, we have, uh, it's fairly new, about, uh, I guess, 18 months old now as an initiative. And the idea, anybody here been to UF Innovate Hub or Innovation Square or District, right? So we have five physical labs in the uh, UF Innovate Hub building, um, but the four blocks uh, that the hub is located on is our Safer Places Lab as well. So what we're trying to do there is work on anti-theft, fraud, and violence uh, research there. And uh, we work with uh, 70 major retail companies in the United States and around the, around the world, including Australia, New Zealand, and, and Europe, and so forth, um, trying to use really good science. And science is uh, a good logic model, a hypothesis, and then good observation. In other words, collecting data. Uh, to see what does that do, how does that support or not support that, and how do we adapt and adjust. And we do three types of research. One, we're here to try and better define the, the dynamics and the typology, if you will, the dynamics of different types of fraud or theft or violence. And they are very different in the way that a human headache can be different, right? So um, when we talk about fraud, we could be talking about online, and there are 100 or more scams there and different techniques when we're talking about fraud in a store uh, or other venue. Uh, when we're talking about violence, we're working on things like uh, intimidation and violence against women in parking lots or in locations uh, through armed robbery events. And uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then also uh, even things like active assailant, active shooter or killer events. So we're trying to get ahead of that. What are signals that we can find earlier? Early detection, just like in medicine is profound in what we do in crime prevention. But uh, we're also one of the few research teams in the world that employs randomized controlled trials. So we use randomized experimental designs. We've conducted uh, just over 30 of those to date. They're, they're a nightmare to pull off. Um, and ours are place-based. We randomly select locations, randomly assign those locations to different treatment options and things like that. But this just gives you an idea of some of the crazy zany things that we deal with because just about anything dangerous or weird happens in a retail environment. Now, we work in any environment. We've worked in Disney World and Universal Studios, cruise ships, uh, all different places, but overwhelmingly retail environments. And bear in mind, retailing is distribution or fulfillment centers, corporate office buildings, parking lots, of course, um, transport trucks. We've got you know, computer systems, websites, executives that travel around the world, so VIP executive protection, all these things that we're dealing with uh, our team. And, and our team is comprised of uh, five of us that are graduate level criminologists. Uh, also, we work with data scientists. And I got moved in 2020 uh, over into the Wertheim College of Engineering to be in the uh, flex team there uh, so I can work more closely with engineers and computer scientists because we need more sensors and better ways to find out what's going on. So you name it, we have, we're dealing with it. A little bit about why crime appears to be on the increase again, at, at where it was waning over the last 25 years, almost 30. Uh, but there's maybe lower consequences for would-be offenders. Um, they don't feel as much downside risk to them in that equation. Um, and we won't go into all those components there, but this is some of the ones that are pointed out in the research literature and elsewhere. Um, but we're also dealing with, and this is particularly critical for us, there's a, there's a lot more upside to stealing and other types of fraud. It's much easier to convert stolen goods to cash. And we actually did an interview yesterday with the New York Times of all things, hey, what is theft from homes that are open during um, open houses uh, or for a, an agent escorted visit to a home? That kind of theft dynamics. It was really interesting for us to think through all that with their reporter, but the same thing goes that they can more readily uh, convert stolen goods to cash, right? Just go on there. And, by our, and keep in mind too, we work with Amazon, who's a major seller of legitimate and inadvertently not so legitimate goods, right? But so are the other retailers. In fact, Walmart, who we worked with extensively, we bought online from them 
um, items that you can use to remove security types, you know, big magnets and all these things. They don't know they're being sold on there. They're so massive at this point. So a lot of opportunity out there for us to deal with. Um, a lot of different types of research that we get involved with. We do crime mapping of all types, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, we get involved in offender interviewing. We're one of the few teams also that interview active criminal offenders, whether they're porch pirates or dishonest employees, uh, shoplifters, of course, whether they're one-off or opportunistic type shoplifters, or if we're talking about boosters that are doing this either semi-regularly or that's what they do, or their fences and so on. Um, armed robbers, we've even worked with armed robbery individuals or crews, um, can be pretty dangerous when you're out there in the wild. Um, and it's, it's particularly interesting to go through, uh, at UF we have four IRBs or institutional review boards. Uh, we go through IRB2, social behavioral research, um, but to convincing them that we'll keep our team safe. Uh, and then again, our research will not uh, put the participant or the subject in harm's way either. It's informed or consensual. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right, so just a little bit of the mixed methods research that we're involved in. Um, so again, we're here about trying to understand the dynamics of problems. Uh, the way we look at things is um, what are the pathways? And you probably can, my father and grandfather being physicians, we're gonna talk a lot about medical analogies here, but the same pathways that you might have for some kind of pathogen, uh, we see that with an offender. Things are happening before and during and after. So what happens at a place or to a person probably didn't start there and isn't gonna end there. So each of those steps and stages that it takes for that offender to accomplish whatever it is they're trying to accomplish, um, and then uh, even accomplishing turning, uh, converting it into cash or whatever it might be, those are all aiming points for solutions, right? For sensors to better detect and define what's going on, and then better action tools to convince them to deter them so they don't launch, or if they do, we disrupt them so we can get U-turns, get U-turns, not keep coming our way, stop the progression. Uh, if that doesn't work, more thorough documentation of the individual or the crew for official sanction, right? In, in incarceration or fining or whatever it might be called for. Um, so the next part is we're trying to better understand harm. <clears throat> uh, I, how many of you here have ever know somebody or been a victim of a crime of any type, right? You don't have to all raise your hands. Is anybody here, you might feel like you've been changed a little bit maybe even a lot, or your loved ones have, depending on the type of crime or how we respond to that. But we're trying to help better define the individual harm that occurs from a crime, whether it's trauma or disruption, uh, or they won't go to certain places anymore, avoid behavior and all this kind of thing, <clears throat> as well as the physical harm that we know can occur, the locational harm. You know, if this place was now robbed, you know, we're in the middle of an armed robbery, it could change us all individually and those that we mean something to or a lot to, um, it could change this place and what happens here. And then of course, the harm that can happen to an enterprise, I deal a lot with the big retailers, uh, and then the community itself, is they have to commit more and more increasingly limited resources and take them from something else and all that to deal with them. So point is, it's a big part of what we do is trying to define that. And then finally, and this is the main area that we work in, and that is, um, Great, how do we do something about it? How do we do it in a science-informed way, evidence-based practice, right? So uh, we're gonna come up with logic models that better describe the steps and stages and what all's going on. And then uh, what do we do in an integrated way? We were with Kroger Company the other day, um, just with CVS and others, um, Walmart, Amazon, they're all asking the same thing. And we work with small retailers too. Hey, I need to more, be more integrated in what I do, more organized about what I'm trying to do and how all the things work together to accomplish what I'm trying to do here. So rigorous assessment's a big part of it. Hey, did this really actually move the needle? But we also, again, going back to criminology, we use the same, a lot of terms as medicine. Did we maybe dose it? We didn't do it right. We didn't dose it right. It's not what we do, but maybe we didn't do it right, the, the right way or didn't execute it properly. So it doesn't mean if we try something, it didn't work, we should abandon it. Hey, maybe we weren't doing it the right way. So that's a, a big part of what happens with our team. Um, we, we work together um, on individual places. Uh, here you see the Walmart um, global security guys, the SAMS guys, uh, the other Walmart people um, trying to understand. Uh, we have lab stores, in other words, they're real stores, but we have over 30 of them here that are um, part of the ecosystem. 
where we're trying to learn from them. Um, but you can see we have a lot, we have six events where they get together, uh, clustered on protecting the supply chain, uh, reducing violence, reducing theft, reducing fraud, and things like that. Even data analytics, how to actually better gather information and make sense of it, how to work together even in a mall or a strip center, instead of just this store getting better, how could we get to better? get better as a group. And then finally that layer of partnership, say with law enforcement and so on. Um, so we won't go through too much here, but that gives you an idea of some of the retailers. I think we've added actually a few Wawa and some others that aren't up there yet, Saks and so forth. Um, recently, we got our hands full. Um, we have the six events. We have working groups that go year round with them on the specific issues like organized retail crime or violence and so on that we work with them on. So it's called S2P, science to practice here. It's translational science where we start with a big, we have, we're such a tiny team, but there's nobody else doing kind of this to translate that into good practice, right? So you'll see over at UF, translational medicine building and so forth. Uh, we deal with the acute and the chronic issues, right? So the theft and fraud that are chronic, even some violence, but then some of the more horrific, bizarre, even dangerous weather, but um, that anything that happens, it seems like we're involved in it. Um, so we had to, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, come up with some more rapid ways to get learnings and had to be very creative, including with our institutional review word IRB, um, on how do we collect data without actually being with other humans. Um, and it was interesting, but we use Matterport cameras uh, where you can get 360 views like anybody's seen those on real estate. If you're like an apartment or a home, we have all these venues Matterported so we can kind of share ideas in a distributed way anywhere in the world, but um, that's part of it. So just showing you, uh, we look at uh, social network analysis, who people that are linked to each other, places that are linked to each other uh, and so forth are critical to us in addition to experimental research. So it's um, a lot. We use theories, we won't go into all that, but um, try and make sense of the world, but why, for example, uh, are these potential targets and these aren't because they're not on the, the, in the behavioral or space, activity space, awareness space of a, say, a motivator like an offender. And so these are more at risk and so on. So we, like any uh, research discipline or scientific discipline, have models that help us understand and explain the real world and then keep doing research to fill in the blanks. But in our case, it, it, we got to get it right or there can be some real, real problems. So um, we look at the red and green person, the greens who we want to come there and come back. The red's the one getting in the way. They're the ones we don't want to come there because they're victimizing others, um, harming others and so forth. So we look at their intent, uh, their capabilities, their access and so on. Um, and then we look at the places, what's different about places. So people, there are variants here and there's variants here that we're trying to understand, explain and, and affect as any discipline would do. Um, going back, I was an infantry officer for a while back in the day in the army, but uh, you know, left and right a bang. Right, what happened before, during, and after, uh, not just what's happening. They're all important. So this is kind of the etiology of a crime event. We go back, um, it sounds sarcastic, but it sort of helps some people, hey, what's a good day for the bad guy in their mind look like? How can we change that equation so they don't wanna do this or they don't wanna do it here or now? Sometimes is what we gotta do. So again, I mentioned some of the types of harm um, we're looking for anomalous behavior um, and we look for cues and clusters, right? We're very sensitive and aware that we don't want to just spy on people for no reason or do things like that. So we're looking for anomalous behavior, somebody that's maybe going from car to car to car in a parking lot. So let's say two or more vehicles, three or more vehicles in one minute, um, maybe anomalous, particularly if you now have a ton of video footage of a parking lot and that almost never happens. We only go to one or maybe we accidentally go to two or we visit with our friend before we leave that kind of thing. So that could be an anomalous cue. Maybe that same individual entered from a non-normal spot and then they're doing that. And then finally they may have something in their hand that may be longer than a cell phone, right? So now you can see a cluster of cues that together might indicate anomalous behavior. You can give a heads up to that place manager. Maybe she can lock the door, call 911 or whatever, or, or collect more information is what we're suggesting, right? So just like the radiologist where AI, computer vision can help that physician say, hey, doc, you might've missed something here. The doctor still makes the call 
uh, let, you know, let me get some more images and angles and things. The same thing in crime prevention. How do we give a better heads up, find those signals that are important to make better informed decisions, um, not less informed decisions. So that's what's happening there because all of us give off all kind of behavioral signature, signatures and signals that we can pick up on. Again, if you're going to a bunch of vehicles or you're coming up to a bunch of people or you're doing things, how you're standing, what you're doing and so on, your uh, angles and, and so on. Those things could be something we want to at least kind of take a look at. So it's a sensor to action play over there at the Safer Places Lab. How do we leverage and better understand earlier uh, that somebody maybe have gone on, has gone online, they took a selfie and posted on social media, I'm headed to Dollar General, and they got a handgun in the picture. That's something we may want to know about earlier rather than later to safeguard the vulnerable, the vulnerable people. So, and that's kind of our mandate, safeguarding vulnerable people. Um, some of the sensors we've got, LIDAR and so on, can make sense of, now we use some of these tools, these tools as research tools. If I do something, put better lighting, let's say at the Walmart on Waldo, uh, we moved one of those surveillance towers close to the bus stop. Um, and I can't tell you the feedback, the positive feedback from some of the, the young ladies, the women that were used, that used Walmart and come in on the public transport about how excited they were now to have better lighting and to have a camera surveillance for them. And uh, while we're there, that picture I showed you earlier with us, standing around with a bunch of Walmart executives, one of the women, one woman almost hit me pulling in next to that tower. I said, well, you know, if I ask you why you're parking right here, you know, hey, this is where I'm going to park. So I feel safer. And if I got my kids, I'm here. Um, so we'll go, go through, again, aiming points, uh, giving you some idea of what that looks like. We're trying to pick up good information. This is an example with armed robbery where working with CVS, Rite Aid, and Walgreens, um, looking at their armed robberies, dissecting those and trying to understand those steps and stages. Now we can convert those into places for us to do something about. Um, we use our theory and, and so on about what we're trying to do here. We then align, okay, what retailers are gonna, what, are gonna do what? We're gonna do testing, everything at the labs, some with you guys, but it just shows you how you take, go from theory to initial research to more confirmative, confirmatory research now you pull out together, you get these guys together. Now let's work on testing, dialing these things in with you to make a change here. Real world example, Advanced Auto Parts, South Florida, they have an ongoing armed robbery issue. Um, and I mean, it's, as we speak, eight of 24 stores in that three county area have been hit. Others haven't. We always wanna know why, why not? Why were these stores hit and not these guys? Eric and I were talking about beforehand, no auto zones or O'Reilly's have been hit. What does that mean, right? So is there a center point? What does this mean for their, where they must reside or hole up? You know, wh why, why not? Why, why not? And are they progressing in their time and space patterns? Are they progressing in their tactics that they're using, their MO, and so on? Those are all things that we can maybe use to one, initially stop it. You know, let's put some incarceration uh, here into effect. Uh, and then so on. And then what can we do in the future for better protection so they don't want to launch, initiate against us again and harm people. So some of the innovation, we have kind of an ecosystem here. Um, we have our engagement lab, I'll show you here in a second, uh, that has almost 180 technologies in it. We also have um, a simulated parking lot. We have a security operations center or a command center. Uh, we have safer places labs. Um, uh, that I mentioned in our ecosystem. And then finally, we have a whole bunch of stores and distribution centers and offices and things like that, real world that we can test in. So uh, using these different environments to our advantage, again, to talk to the people that are committing these issues, um, where they reside. Uh, one thing that we're looking at is aggressive street violence and behavior. Um, we don't, we're not saying homeless because it's not really accurate, but who are those people that are they may happen to be homeless, but more importantly, what harm is being created and how can we affect that, help them in depth with partners where they live. You all talked about funding, UF's medical outreach and so on. We're interested in looking at ways to create uh, at baseline better conditions and things like that, and then work in, inwardly as much as working in and out. So 
it's all part and parcel, the leg bones connected to the hip bone here. So we need to look at behavior in all different ways um, and what we might do to make the conditions and the situation better um, at that level. Um, and the retailers, by the way, are very interested in that, but they love the idea of having an evidence-based approach. Instead of just clown face painting day, can we be more targeted in where we go and how we work and what we might fund in some of these communities um, for better results uh, and so forth. So the ideation lab is one of our places. It's for human-centered design thinking. Um, everything's mobile and modular, even the sofas, and it's a place to tease out ideas uh, systematically. We have a sim lab, a simulation lab that is a cave environment. Um, that you can get immersed almost at near life-size scale, surround sound behind the screens. It could be indoors or outdoors. You could hear birds singing. You could be whatever is going on, but we can put people in there, shoppers, the, uh, offenders, um, or customers or whomever and change conditions. We even have eye trackers to see where, where their gaze is looking first and most and things like that. The shimmer, what do they most react to or respond to emotively and things like that. So in addition to what they're telling us, we can triangulate you know, multiple data points. So um, it's called mixed method or multi method research. Um, virtual reality, we're working with US digital uh, team over there and uh, Digital Worlds Institute in the uh, College of Art. And it's a cool way to uh, more rapidly generate more very realistic environments inside and out and try out different options, right? How do we do this? How do we do this better? And so on, right? Dosing. Um, so that just gives you, that's a Home Depot that's been modeled uh, and so forth. Some of the parking lots working like here in a Publix parking lot, how do we better model these places and get more and more realistic experience to better figure out how somebody to deter the red guy and better comfort the green shopper or whatever. So we have an activation lab. Uh, we have increasing number of edge servers going in this place with GPUs being donated by NVIDIA. Many of you or most of you know that NVIDIA has got a huge uh, multi, multi-million dollar play at the University of Florida. And we've been a beneficiary of you know, a tiny bit of that in a good way. Um, so we've got some GPUs, Lenovo um, is giving us servers so, um, to work on different ways to more quickly determine what's going on. And you know things like commercial burglary, not only can you can lose a lot, but it's incredibly expensive to continually replace glass and doors and other components, as well as being disruptive. You've got to shut down and, and, and your people get, get scared. They're, they're, you know, they don't want to work in a place or shop in a place that they don't feel comfortable um, going to. So, uh, and you see communities like in South and in, uh, in, um, out in San Francisco, where some of the retailers we work with, they've closed as many as a dozen, 16 stores, only operate during daylight hours and things because employees just will not work at these places. And that harms that community area, those people that were dependent on those stores for a lot of things. So, um, here's some of the computer vision things that are being worked on by uh, companies that are working with us. Because in addition to 70 retail companies and all their divisions, uh, we're working with uh, over 80 technology companies. I mentioned Lenovo and NVIDIA, but all kind of companies like Bosch and uh, Sensormatic and ADT Commercial and so forth. And, and a lot of good green use cases like um, spills, lack of gear, and things like that, that we can help get on top of much more rapidly. Um, so that's the activation lab. Here's the engagement lab. Um, again, a place with uh, just about, actually now almost 190 technologies of all types. Um, again, things in here are mobile and modular fixtures uh, and things like that, the display fixtures. So we can look at different use cases, um, uh, soft goods, hard goods, theft, fraud, um, even things like active shooter. Um, how can we more rapidly detect this is a gunshot? in what direction the gunshots are coming from in a place that it takes a while for us to sense what it is and not know where to go. How can we help people survive <clears throat> on top of preventing it in the first place? We have a parking lot lab area. We have VR parking lots and we have real parking lot outside and there. Even porch lab, we're working on porch piracy. So the last mile it's called by the retailers. Um, anybody ever had a package store? <laughs> I don't know somebody that has. Um, now, the first thing you do is you don't want anybody to know you have a package, right? So here we've put, put a planner, we've put a box, you could put it behind the box, 
we now have two signs saying, please put it in the box. That means they're only about 30% compliant. Most of them are on the phone, listening to music, whatever they're doing, but they're not putting it in the box. So some opportunity there. Um, to, and here's how we look at the world. Here's what you could do, good, better, best, you know, on protection, let's say with four points. Another science to practice. Here's our command center, our SOC lab, security operation center lab. Um, tons of technologies. All the sensors outside and in are being pulled in through fiber cable now as we speak and being set up. So this will be a world-class place. Uh, the retailers have a lot going on in a lot of stores. Some of them have, we've got companies that have 10, 20,000, 1,000 locations um, and there's a lot going on. So they wanna be able to more rapidly understand and support. Um, all right, so that was a little bit about Safer Places Lab, where we're located, um, what it looks like. Um, the, there you see the hub building where we're located. It's these four square blocks. Um, so we we'll use those as individual testing places, as well as how to connect or create a larger mesh to communicate. If we've got a, a predatory criminal, and this actually happened the other day where there was a serial rapist in this whole area here, and he was moving through, and actually some of our cameras were picking them up. So the Gainesville police detective, when she came uh, in there and was working with us, and this is kind of a cool story because she was offered a promotion, but she wanted to stay in sex crimes to help with these kind of things. Uh, but, but they were very grateful. Our, our cameras have actually helped uh, with other issues like here at Top Dave and over here. But um, so we're in the real world there it's in that translation. It's showing how we're connecting places with our command center, even working with drones, Looking, working on curbside. You don't want to go get your new iPhone and somebody relieves you at gunpoint. So we're looking at that or, or deconflicting two-ton automobiles from people. Right? So they're all issues that's just showing uh, using the drones. UF has a drone team. Um, so we're leveraging that capability to better understand dynamics as well. Um, and I think a company, the one that does the, all the deliveries for Walmart and others is going to start working with us on this issue. So that's what I've got. Um, on what in the world we're dealing with and how we're trying to deal with it. So any questions or comments or suggestions? I'll, I'll kind of work. I don't, but um, law enforcement does. Um, I don't, it's the majority that are unlocked. The vehicle's not locked, if that's what you're asking. Uh, where there's a burglary, auto burglary, yes. So. Locker doors. This gentleman. So real quick, um, we've all seen those scenes from Saks Fifth Avenue in San Francisco, people breaking in and you hear about the major crime syndicates that are getting into that and some local operators. And we know that part of it is because you have some folks in, uh, in, in the DA office or whatever that's saying, well, don't worry about getting punished for that. How much of your work do you do, you do with uh, municipalities like those that are struggling and the politicians are realizing that maybe we made a mistake and now help, we need help to deal with this. Oh, man, right in there, right in there. It's a great question. Um, so Eric and I were talking about this earlier. Um, so you saw uh, San Francisco could be a poster child, unfortunately, in what you're describing right now. Um, one thing that we're hearing described by some of the groups that work with the legislatures, and I can tell you the state of California is trying to do some pretty dramatic changes. And in fact, their legislation, their legislation office for the governor just reached out to our team two weeks ago. Uh, we actually sent some of the Florida legislation to see if they could compare notes. Um, what they are describing this is LTEs, low turnout elections. And in some of these elections, like in the Manhattan DA, we heard, because we work with a lot of retailers in New York City with NYPD doing research, that uh, a, a 7 million is roughly, I understand the population uh, and less than 100,000 people voted. So you might get a DA in there that may or may not accurately represent that community. So a big part of our research is what we're calling the voice of the victim, right? And uh, GPD, we're gonna work and we're gonna go into certain areas that have had a cluster of crimes and get the real accurate voice of the victim from uh, other African Americans or whomever that area happens to be, not me, uh, to get that accurate voice to help us better assess what are the real issues here 
what are the real solutions you're looking for? And so there are now co coalitions you may be aware of, of some of these mayors who are saying, uh-uh, we don't want to defund. We may want to refund or reformulate what we're trying to do and how we're doing it. So I do believe that some of the prosecutors, maybe the elected one, not necessarily those under them, have made a difference in some places to the positive and some places, I think, to the negative. And um, the Vice President Bloomingdale spent two weeks out there, Peter Chi, in, or one week out in San Francisco Bay, met with all the police and prosecutors in that area and sheriffs, two sheriffs. Um, and a captain of the SFPD was telling him, she goes, look, of every 100 cases that I have that are really good lockdown cases, our current DA will only prosecute five of them. No, we don't know why. We just, he will not accept those cases. So I don't know if that's addressing your question, but I think there's more work to be done. But we need the voice of you all and the voice of the victim for a better accurate picture. Uh, Reed, Dr. Hayes, would you pop back up here real quick? When I, when I said hang out, I meant actually hang out up here. Um, but that, that's nice that <clears throat> you'll, you'll hang out for a few minutes. I know we had one or two other questions maybe, but we, we've run over um, wonderful presentation. I. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm kind of looking at Eric and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's, you guys are so, so appropriately located over there in the, in the innovation district. I mean, that, that's what you do. That's, I, you think about the, the criminals these days are, are getting smarter and smarter with all their technological applications and um, cybercrime, all that stuff, but you guys are pretty smart too. So that, this makes me feel good with, um, all the, the applications you have in the, the lab. So thank you for your talk today. We've got um, a coin to commemorate your time with us and, um, and preparing this presentation and sharing with us. It's um, kind of gives you um, maybe a, a summary, if you will, of, of what Rotary and Rotary International is, if, if we could fit it on a coin. On the front, it has our motto, which is service above self. Yeah, th this serve to change lives that's important that's our annual theme this changes each year but the the motto is uh service above self which is something that we're, we're proud of it's something we adhere to something else that we try to adhere to is the four-way test of all the things that we think say or do we ask is it the truth is it fair to all concerned will it build goodwill and better friendships and will it be beneficial to all concerned? So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Hayes, for your time today and for everything you do for our community to keep us safe. Everybody, the winning ticket is... 389, 389. See you all back here next Tuesday.